been looking at uh, getting out of your rut from the book of Judges. There are a lot of ruts in this book. But today we're going to focus on getting out of your miserable rut. All right? And uh, I've I got to ask this. Have you ever been in a miserable rut? Oh, yeah, I heard that. All right. I got one hand. Yes, yes. I've been in a rut. Uh, how about physically? You ever been physically in a rut? I mean, just in misery. You know, I thought that passing kidney stones was the most miserable thing in my whole life and uh, until I got food poisoning. Oh, that was miserable. And uh, I don't know, maybe there's something even more yet to experience of being a misery, just, just physically, you know, just miserable, miserable. How about emotionally? You ever been emotionally miserable? Just an mis- emotional wreck? I see a few hands, all right, yeah, all right, yeah. Uh, if you've ever had a broken relationship, I don't care if it's just a, a, your first dating and your heart is crushed, uh, or if it was a divorce, or uh, emotionally, maybe it was emotionally a loss of someone, and you are just totally, totally miserable, nothing in life seems to be going right when that kind of thing happens. How about intellectually? Ever been uh, just frustrated? Frustrated. So every now and then, uh, something intellectually happens, and, it, and you're just totally frustrated. Uh, I had a job that I took that um, it was way over my head. And I was so frustrated because I'd go in every day trying to figure out what I was supposed to do. <laughs> and I'd go home every night and study all night to figure out the software I was supposed to be running for this company that I took the job for. And uh, it, what it turned out is I was in a sales team for, for, this, for one company that ran the software. And another company hired me to actually run the software, not to sell it. And so I knew all about it, but I had no idea how it worked. And so I hated this job because I didn't know what I was doing. I was totally frustrated. Man, was I glad when I was able to land a different job. Uh, that's intellectual frustration. You just... You just Intellectually, you just can't get your head around it. You just, don't, you just can't grasp it. And then they're socially miserable. Oh, man. Have you ever felt socially just totally out of place and felt just totally miserable? We go to a wedding. It's up, uh, uh, up on, what's the name of that island? Uh, Mackinac Island. And then we're at Mackinac Island. And uh, we were told it was a casual wedding. I took a jacket and everything. My wife said, no, no, it's a casual wedding. Everybody's going to be casual. She convinces me to go casual. So I cross over on the boat, casual. I get to the wedding. Everyone is dressed up. Everyone. Except me. And all of a sudden, I am like a social misfit. I, I mean, you want to crawl under a rock. In high- you ever been like that? It's a miserable experience, isn't it? It's miserable. It's miserable. It's miserable. And, and not only are the, those miseries, but there's financial. You ever been totally impoverished? I mean, really. Um, you just didn't know where any money was going to be coming from for you to just make it in life. That is a miserable, sick feeling place to be in, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Here's the worst of all. I mean, there's a lot of miseries in life. This one is the worst of all miseries. I call it spiritual misery. It's when you have that sense deep down inside that God has abandoned you. Where are you, God? Why are you not hearing me? Why are you not answering? Why are you not there? And all of a sudden, you get this misery. You're miserable because you feel like God isn't there and you're abandoned by God. You're on your own. You're on your own. That's more or less the one I really want to focus on today. My premise, though, is this. The Lord our God is merciful. God is merciful. Mercy means he has pity. He has compassion. Every now and then, God's got to wipe away a tear from his eye, so to speak, because he is so moved with compassion and pity and mercy upon us. In our text today, I'm focusing on this one verse, chapter 10, verse 16 in the book of Judges, and he, referring to God, 
could bear Israel's misery no longer. When you're in that place of spiritual misery and you think like, whoa, where is God? God is paying attention. He knows where you're at. He's not lost track of you. And when God saw Israel's misery, he could bear it no longer. I, that's just powerful. Powerful, powerful, powerful. So how did they happen to fall into such misery? That's a, that's a question you have to ask yourself. So I want to jump into this book and look at the context uh, of the, the passage. In the context of this misery, we find that in the context, God had been blessing Israel. You know, in the, in the New Testament, a person gets saved, they get baptized, they, they join the church, and, and they become a disciple, a follower, and God is blessing. And our text here is going to say, God saved them. After the time of Abimelech, we looked at him last week, Abimelech, uh, and it was a, Abimelech was a, an evil man. And it says, after the time of Abimelech, the son of Issachar, Tola, Tola, uh, uh, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo. I think it's Dodo, maybe it's Dudu. Uh, he, he rose to save Israel, all right? He rose to save Israel. God raised up a deliverer. And so now he lived in Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim, and he led Israel. And the word led is really he judged Israel. He judged Israel 23 years and that he died and was buried. For 23 years, things are going great. Isn't that awesome? Now, here's what I like. The, the, the best part comes next. It says uh, there was more of God's blessing because he was followed by Jer of, of Gilead who led Israel 22 years. Oh, now we got... 45 years to the good. Isn't that great? I mean, Israel has finally seems like learned its left that is living for God, is serving God. He had 30 sons who rode on donkeys. They controlled 30 towns in Gilead, uh, which to this day are called uh, Haboth, Jer, which uh, when Jer died, he was buried in Cayman. All right. These two are called minor judges. They're only minor because there's not a lot of story written about them. The ones that got a lot of story, they're called major judges. But these guys are probably the majors and the others are the minors because the majors, nothing said about them because while they live, everything goes great. It's kind of like the news. You ever read the news? Do they report the good stuff? No, they report the bad stuff. And the book of Judges, it's not giving a long story about how good it is. It's focusing here on how bad the times were, how bad the times were. And they were serving God for 45 years. Now I'm going to turn from the context to the cause. It says the cause of their misery is that they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, after a 45-year run, here they go again through this cycle. Not only do they do evil in the eyes of the Lord, but they serve the Baals and the Astroths. But watch what happens and the God of Aram, and the God of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of Ammonites, the gods of the Philistines. They started making a collection, a pantheon of gods. The whole world began to influence them rather than they influencing the world with representing the one and only true God. It says they forsook the Lord and they no longer served him. Oh, they really stumbled. They really stumbled. This is the cause of their misery. Now, there's consequences of our misery. Every time we stumble into sin, there is a consequence. Every time. So here we go again. He became angry with them. God was infuriated with them. A good 45-year run, and now you've got to stumble back into your old way. And it says he was infuriated with them, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines, the Ammonites, who that, and that year shattered and crushed them, and for 18 years they oppressed all the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan in Gilead in the land of the Amorites. And so God sold them into slavery. Here we go again. Conflict. The Ammonites also crossed over the Jordan to fight with them. He said to fight not only against them, but he also against those who were in Judah, that territory in the south, they crossed over and fought not only with them, but Benjamites. 
not only with them, but Ephraim. And Israel was in great distress. Perhaps the most thorough and modern commentary on the book of Judges was done by Leon Wood. He was a scholar. He, was from, he taught at uh, Cornerstone University here in, in Michigan, over in Grand Rapids. He calls this whole period, his book is called The Distressing Time of the Judges. It's from this verse and a previous verse and, and another place in the, in the book of Judges. They were distressed. What it's saying is they had great distress Great distress. We also call that, they were miserable. They were miserable. I don't know what your misery is today. I don't know if it's physical, emotional, relational, social. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what misery that you may have in your life, what misery, what miserable thing that is there. But they were miserable because they had committed a crime. They had brought the misery upon themselves. And often we do that. The Israelites cried out to the Lord, We have sinned against you. Forsaking our God and serving the Baals. We have sinned against you. This is the crime. And the crime of their misery is even is so, so great. They were forsaking God. They were serving idols, they were serving the world that was around them, serving themselves rather than God, and we've seen this whole cycle go round and around, but there's something really unique about this one, because there's a little sh chicanery going on here, they're pulling off some shenanigans here, uh, they, they are not really in their heart believing what they're saying with their lips, they're kind of deceptive and deceiving when they made this confession. God says, you're only using me in a crisis. What? Yeah, he says, listen, what he says, when the Egyptians or the Amorites or the Ammonites or the Philistines or the Sidonians, he says, when all, all of these, you know, the Amalekites, the Manoites, when they oppress you and you cry out to me for help, didn't I save you from their hands? I do this over and over and over again. I keep doing this over and over again. He said, now listen, but you have forsaken me and served other gods. He said, listen, you made, you made your bed, now you lie in it. You've made your bed. He said, so I will no longer save you. Instead, he says, now lie in your bed, go cry out to the gods you have chosen and let them save you when you are in trouble. God was really upset, wasn't he? Whoa. Whoa. They were miserable because they brought this on themselves and God said, every time you get in a jam, that's the only time you come to me. It's like one Father's Day, I found this little quip about uh, on Father's Day, I got a call from my son. So one time of the year, I get a call from my son when he's not asking for money. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? When I get in a jam, I get on my knees, I pray, and God delivers me. And then, I'm, yeah, God, I'm going to serve you. About a year and a half ago, two years ago, I went to a funeral of one of my Sunday school teachers. My Sunday school teacher, Mr. Brielt, he came to the Lord in World War II in France, fighting the Germans in a foxhole when he got shot by a machine gun bullet in the arm. There, wounded in the arm, caught in the middle of a battlefield, he prayed and said, God, if you get me out of this, I will serve you every day of my life. Wow. Of course, he was, didn't die because he wound up being my Sunday school teacher. <laughs> he survived. But he carried this wound in his arm, big scar, where he'd been hit, okay? And uh, he carried this big scar, and uh, it was his reminder. I made a commitment to serve you every day of my life. Every day of my life. He didn't have to keep crying out to the Lord for help because he was getting in jams. The Lord blessed the man. He blessed the man. I'm not saying he didn't have difficulties in life. 
but they weren't because he was generating them. I was 16 years old and I'd gotten involved in a drug incident that left me hospitalized for a few weeks. I was unconscious for several days when I came around. Oh, man, I made a deal with God. God, you know I've been playing games with you. I've been playing games. This wasn't real. This wasn't genuine. I've been going through the motions. But I'm going to serve you every day of my life. I had a reminder for a long time because for some strange reason, I'd lost the feeling in my left leg through the whole incident. And uh, when I would walk, it would be like, you know when your foot's asleep and you've got that feeling of needles and pins going into your foot? Every step would be like that, okay? At first, and then it, that, that sensation away, and it was like I felt nothing. I kind of had to look to see, am I underground, okay? And I would pray, Lord, please don't take this away. I want this as a reminder that you spared my life so that every day I will remember he took it away. And so now I'm like everybody else. I don't have that daily constant reminder. And I make a commitment on Sunday, by Wednesday, Thursday, I've forgotten what I committed. And I'm back into the cycle all over again. God says, hey, you only cry out to me when you're in a jam you don't have a relationship with me the rest of the time. He said, you made your bed. Now lie in it. Go call to what's more important. You think sports is more important than reading the Bible and praying and talking to me? You think your job is more important? Go ask them to help you. Come on, just go out there and just see how, see how that works for you. Uh -huh, go ahead, just try it a little bit. And so here they are, and they're in misery, and they're just terribly, and they're miserable. And God is saying, you've gotten yourself into this, this mess. Go ahead. Fix it on your own. Let's see how that works for you. <laughs> it's at that point we come to the real cure here. The real cure to misery is that they have a genuine confession. No longer lip service. Now they realize, God is really angry with me. And the Israelites said to the Lord, we have sinned. I can just see him scream, no, God, I'm a sinner. What he did was wrong. I admit it. And then they add to it, not just confession, but I call this next one contrition. I mean, it's coming from their heart. It's deep down in their heart, their fundamental, innermost part of their being. They're saying, do with us whatever you think, but don't abandon us. Rescue us. They're contrite. Contrite's uh, not a popular term in our vocabulary today. We speak more about being proud and being number one, and we're not humble and we're not contrite. In the passage, it says that they then even got, beyond their contrition, they, they had an alteration. They, they changed. They got rid of their foreign gods among them, and they served the Lord. There was a radical change. It wasn't, oh, no, we're just going to quit this. They got rid of them. They got rid of them. As a teenage kid, we had a, a, a youth group that was growing in number, and, and God was working in our midst. A couple of us were called to ministry out of that group, and, and uh, several of us went to Bible colleges, and, and that group was just an awesome, awesome time in my life. Uh, the leader of that group, uh, he just died two weeks ago, or a week and a half ago or so, about a week ago, I guess. I'm trying to count my days. The funeral's this afternoon. I'm going to be going to it, and you're all wondering why I'm wearing a... I got a funeral to go to today. <laughs> but the leader of that group, uh, he, he let us... We, we started up about 5, 10 kids, 25 kids, 35, 55. When it got to 75 kids, all right, they, they did something really special for us as a youth group. The church started pouring money. There were services where there were more teenagers in the church than there were adults. Isn't that great? Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. God was at work. And there was this, one of the guys in the group, when, when he said, you know, my music, he had this huge LP album collection. He said, my music is getting in my way of serving God. He got rid of all of his records. And he, he didn't just sell them off. He had a party where he broke them all up. It was fun. <laughs> Smash it, smashed all these. 
He said, I'm not going back. And he meant it. In his heart, he was contrite about this. He was lowly. He was depending upon God. And he said, I'm, I'm really getting rid of this stuff in my life. I'm not playing games. He still serves the Lord to this day. That's what it is. You see, when you do that kind of thing, you experience a revival. This isn't in the book of Judges. This is in the book of Isaiah. I've always been taken by this passage. For this is what the high and lofty one says. That's God. He's high and lofty. And we are just a little tiny speck. But this is what the high and lofty one says. He who lives forever. God, whose name is holy. He is set apart from all that is evil. And there I am, the little speck, the evil thing. And I'm in his presence. He says, I live in a high and holy place. But listen to this. But also with him who is contrite. Got a broken heart. Sees what they've done wrong. And they are broken over it. It's an admission that comes from their heart. Not just off their lips. Not just lip service. Deep down inside, they're contrite, they're broken. I have offended the true and living God, and I am broken inside over this. He says, and lowly in spirit. I mean, that is getting, that is just bowing down. You are low. It is humbling. The opposite is pride, lifting yourself up. Uh, Instead of contrite, you're braggadocious. These are the opposites. This is the opposite. Listen, he says, I dwell with him, that person, for a reason, to revive the spirit of the lowly. (laughs) God is a God of revival. He rejuvenates. He infuses new life. To revive the heart of the contrite. God is in the business. When you are so miserable, if you turn it to him and really mean it, contrite, and you're lonely, and you really mean business, he will turn your misery to joy. He will do it. He will do it. You need to experience God's mercy. God looked down from heaven. He saw this contrite spirit among his people that they'd really gotten rid of everything. They were on track for God. And he saw their misery. And at this point, God says that God could bear Israelites' misery no longer. God's watching us. He sees our misery. And he cares. But when we're on that cycle over and over and over again, we're doing the same thing over and over and again, he's rescuing over and over and over again, and he says, wait, at what point is it real for you? Make it real. Truly trust me. Truly trust me. So, I click twice. So, we really expect what, at this point, because the cycle, we've been going through this cycle over and over again, we really expect in the cycle that uh, the, the next thing we're going to see is God will send a judge. God will send a judge. But in this passage, it says that, uh, oh, I got that in the wrong place. Oh, I'm clicking the wrong direction. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't normally do that. At this point, when they're really expecting God to raise up a judge, it says the the, the Ammonites were called to arms, and they're coming against the Israelites. And the Israelites assembled, and their leader said, where's the judge? God, God, where's where's the judge? We cried out. We've done this. And the leader said, well, whoever will launch the attack against the Ammonites will be the head over all of those living in Gilead. God, raise somebody up. Now, it's not until the next chapter that we're told that God raises up a guy by the name of Jephthah. Jephthah. We're coming to the most difficult passage in the whole book of uh, of, of Judges next time. Uh, It's just a bizarre passage. But uh, God's going to eventually raise up, and he's not called a judge until the end of his life. And so we really don't know. know, God is saying, okay, you're going, to have to, you're going to have to sort through this one. I'm going to raise up the guy, but I'm not telling you. He's not, you're going to have to work your way through this one. And sometimes I think God does that with us. 
We've got to work our way back to, you know, we've confessed and God says, okay, you're going to, you're just going to put me on hold again. As soon as I bail you out, you're going to go do your own thing all over again. No, I'm going to make this a little bit more of a struggle for you to get back on track. But he does. God's, God looked down with compassion and pity. And without telling him who he is, he's going to raise up the judge who will rescue them. So we're all uh, uh, subject to misery, all kinds of miseries. But uh, I, my most concern here is spiritual misery deep down inside being spiritually miserable. And what do you do to get out of that? How do you get unstuck? Well, the answer is you have to repent. That's the R in your outline that uh, is not underlined. I forgot to underline that one. You have to get unstuck. The way you get unstuck from your misery is you have to repent. And that starts with a confession. A confession where you admit, I blew it. I messed up. I was wrong. I disobeyed. I stumbled, whatever it was. The more specific you are, you know what? I blew my diet. You know what? I had one too many to drink. You name it. You know what? I took prescription drugs that I should not have because I could have handled it without it. You name it. I cheated on my income tax. I withheld my tithe. You name it. God, I got angry because the guy cut me off. Maybe he was in a big hurry. I name what it is. That's part of confession. God, I blew it. It's got to be contrite. Contrition only comes when you view what you did as God views it. You look at what you did and you say, God, from your perspective, this must be breaking your heart. That I, a Christian, a follower of Jesus, would deliberately go against what you say, God, I am so sorry. And I really pour out my heart. I have a contrite attitude. And then I make an alteration. I change. I hit reset. Boom, God, I am not going down that path anymore. We call that repentance. You're going one direction. You're going to do a reset. You're going to turn around and go the other way. How do you get, un how do you get unstuck? This is what you do. You confess. You're contrite. You, you make alterations or reset in your life because when you do, this is what happened. I, I'm guaranteed of it. God can bear your misery no longer. He sees you and your relationship with him and he can bear your misery no longer. And he will rescue you. I have a son by the name of David. My son David is my oldest son. His name means beloved. And I used to tell him all the time, David, I named you beloved because I love you. You are my beloved. I love you. You're, I love you. You're my beloved son. One day he got in some big trouble. And he was, I was angry and upset. Oh, just like the text. God was infuriated. The father was infuriated. I was upset. And I got hold of him and I was scolding him. And he's crying. He's contrite. <laughs> he's crying. I'm I'm sorry. And then he said, and then after all, Dad, I am your beloved. <laughs> you know what happened? The exact, the exact same thing that happened to God in this passage. He could bear the misery no longer. I could bear my son's misery no longer. I wrap my arms around him and said, David, you are my beloved. I love you. I forgive you. That's what this passage is about. God's not out to get us. But when we step out of bounds, he disciplines us like a true father would. His, his son. He deals with us like his kids. But when we keep, you know, we, we get to play the game. We know, the, we know how to play the game. We know how to game a person. When we start gaming God, he says, listen, I'm on to you. It's time for you to be contrite. 
It's time for you to really confess from your heart. It's time for you to allow me to really bless you. You know what? You can do that right now. You can do that right now. You can pray. Let's do it. Father in heaven, there's someone here who's come in today with some kind of misery in their heart and they know it. And perhaps at the very bottom of that misery is some area of their life where they know they're not on track with you. You've pointed that out to them in their mind today. You've been speaking to them because your witness bears witness, your spirit bears witness with our spirit. Lord, that we're children of God and, and when we're out of line, you convict us within our hearts. I pray for that person who's got some misery that right now they would admit it, they would confess it and what it is that's at the source of it. They would be genuine, deep down, contrite. Say, God, I see from your perspective I, I, I've, I've made you pretty upset. Will you forgive me? After all, I am your child. We know, O oh God, there is no God like you who pardons and forgives when we are genuine and we're willing to change. Forgive us, O Lord, of our sins. Bless us today as we go from this place. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.